Okay, we're going to talk today about gasoline direct injection basics. And I've already asked you guys what you know about gasoline direct injection. If I've got fuel injection, I'm basically going to take the crankshaft sensor and I'm going to let the crankshaft sensor decide how many times I fire the fuel injectors. And you know, the speed of the fuel injectors matches the cadence of the crankshaft. And the crankshaft, the faster it goes, click, 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 click. All right, then the fuel injector pulse is modified by the way you operate the throttle, engine coolant, mass airflow, map if it's got that, so on and so forth. So, what I want to know here is where does the injectors put the gasoline in a conventional multi-point fuel injected engine? Be ready to make notes now. You don't play with your phone. Why is it everybody sits in that chair always plays with their phone? I don't get that. But uh, what about it? Where does it squirt? Where does the injector squirt the fuel on a conventional MPI engine? In the intake. In the intake, right behind the intake valve. And it's stored there for just a second. And uh, so we've actually, all right, now your old throttle body injection is a wet intake. So it sprays it above the throttle plate and it's just kind of like a carburetor. So the throttle body injection and a carburetor are sort of interchangeable and all that. And everything that you could look at in an engine, as far as the basic engine part of it, is going to be the same all the way from carburetors all the way down to multi-point fuel injection because nothing has to change a whole heck of a lot because it's all coming out of the intake past the intake valve. Well, this one here, the amount of fuel is determined by engine operating conditions, and this is a map. This is basically a fuel map. It's like a multi-dimensional spreadsheet, and all those little cells right there, each one of them, it says when all of these conditions come together, this is how much fuel I'm going to put, this is what kind of spark time I'm going to have, this is what I'm going to purge the canister or not. All of that in that little cell, it's like dealing a deck of cards, and you've got to know exactly which card to give the guy every time the conditions are met. So you've got to follow when you're working on uh, gasoline direct injection, all OEM safety procedures we're working on, system residual pressure has got to be bled down. Now we talk a lot of times about bleeding the pressure off of these potential pressure, uh, fuel systems we got, because you know how many of you guys talk, you just take it loose, it sprays everywhere you had that happen, like on a good hot end, you phew, just sprays all around. You think, well, not a big deal, you know, let's wipe it off my face, or I'll, you know, we'll get on my shirt, maybe I'll blow it off with the air hose or something like that. Now this right here is a whole lot different, because we're talking in this particular system about thousands of pounds of fuel pressure. And there was a picture that the guy had when I was up at KC Vision of this guy that actually took one of these use and the gas pressure sprayed and hit him in the finger and it made a wound in his finger and he didn't think anything about it until a couple of days later he saw blood poisoning working its way up his hand. So he basically just had that one wound right there. Now, what I'm saying is this is really, 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 really important to make sure that you follow the procedures on bleeding that thing off before you take it off. You know on your diesels, on your common rail diesels, you got to make sure there's not pressure trapped there. And this thing is going to trap the pressure on that high pressure rail. That pressure is not going to bleed off unless there's something wrong somewhere. All right. Some components are designed for a one-time use, like some of the, I mean, the lines and some of the other stuff you take off of there. You've got to look in your book. It's going to tell you don't use this. Like on this particular one that Adam was showing you from the other day, uh, that line that goes from here to here, once you take it off, you, gotta, you can't put that line back on. You've got to have a, line, a new line to replace it. Okay, torque values are really important because you don't just tighten it up. If you had a VI-8 and all that, you know, you've got to make sure that you get them the right way. Okay, so they manufacturers went with gasoline direct injection because there were changes in emission laws, changes in fuel, uh, you know, uh, corporate average fuel economy is what CAFE stands for, 35.5 in 2016, increased diesel emission soot and NOx requirements and DDI, you know, attempts to combine the economy and power of a diesel with a reduced noise level on a gas engine and approaches the fuel economy of a hybrid. So. They get really good fuel economy. They use really small engines. And let's see if we can make this little video play here. It's real short. Doesn't take but a second to play it. All right. Now, this is basically you're looking at that's gasoline direct injection right there. All right. You notice that the fuel is playing directly into the cylinder, not behind the intake. Oh, the wind blowing that. Okay. Well, you can see that happening there. All right. Okay. Come on. Let me go to the next one and get my finger off of that slide there. All right. 
8 to 22 percent higher fuel economy, more torque, and horsepower, allowing smaller engines. You'll usually see these SUVs like an Equinox or something with a little bitty engine in it that connected, can inject fuel anytime during the four stroke cycle of event. The point of the matter is, not only can you decide when it's, in, I mean, how much is injected, you can decide when it's injected and how it's injected. Write that down. You got multi point fuel injection, can tell you, can do it, to put it in there for us how much, but it cannot determine when it goes in. When that valve opens, the fuel's going in there on a the multi point fuel injection, you know, port fuel injection. On these right here, you're in, I mean, the PCM is in total control. You've also got really, really, really tiny fuel droplets on this, uh, coming out of these injectors because they actually poke, poke the, drill these holes with lasers in the end of these injectors or something. Uh, cylinder scavenging is greatly enhanced. What's cylinder scavenging? I know you guys aren't engineers, but tell me what cylinder scavenging is. What, how do we scavenge the cylinders on a conventional engine? You understand suck, squeeze, bling, blow? What do you do to get rid of the last little bit of exhaust gas that may be hanging around at the end of the exhaust stroke? While the exhaust valve is still open, we begin to open the intake valve, and that is called overlap. And as that intake stream starts to pour in there, it's going to push all the rest of that exhaust out, and then your, the exhaust valve, as it's closing, the intake valve begins to open. As a matter of fact, you can, if you can see the valves, you can find top dead center exhaust by looking at the overlap. If you watch it, whenever this intake valve just starts to open, when the exhaust valve is still open a little bit on most engines, you can find the top net center exhaust stroke with that. Cylinder scavenging is enhanced. Compression ratios can be higher. A lot of these engines have got a 14 to 1 compression ratio. And a compression ratio on a conventional gas engine is, you know, maybe 8 to 9 to 1, something like that. Uh, leaner fuel mixtures during cold engine operation, adjustable fuel modes of, to target emission problems. So if they're having emission problems, they can basically have different types of fuel injection pulses for that reason. So you got reduced engine pumping losses, cylinder charge cooling, smaller droplets, reduced cylinder wall temperature, spark knock is a lot more controlled. They can actually, they don't have to jerk the timing around to, per, you know, to prevent spark knock. They can actually change the way the fuel is injected. All right, so you got all these changes in the fuel delivery and control systems. A little tiny, this is a disadvantage, a little tiny injection control window in microseconds. It has to be shot in there at exactly the right time. Now, uh, all of uh, you guys are all familiar with uh, the way that, with the feedback system for the oxygen sensor, right? The feedback basically is your air fuel mixture is controlled by watching the exhaust and changing the mixture so that it's optimum all the time. Well, on these systems here, the fuel rail pressure is actually a closed loop system the same way. And so it not only does it change the way that the injector sprays, it can also change the high rail, fuel rail pressure because it's got a way to do that, uh, and so on and so forth. We'll talk a little bit about that for a minute. So you got more levels of soot and carbon formation due to lower intake temperatures and exhaust inversion and increased electrical power demands for the injectors. These injectors typically, and this is a sort of a general statement, they fire on about 50 volts. What does that mean? What does that sound like? If you know anything about Duramax and Power Stroke, the older 7.3 Power Strokes fired on 115 volts. The uh, newer Power Strokes like the 40, let's see, 93 volts on a Duramax is what they were using. And then it was like 47 volts on the 6 liter, and the voltage is all up around there. So why do we need so much voltage? It's got to happen quick. The higher the voltage, the quicker it happens. You know what I mean? So they have low resistance and high voltage, and bam, bam, you, can, you can do something real quick that way. Uh, what is a regular, uh, well, never mind on that, I started to hit you with a question you wouldn't know the answer to anyway. Proper engine maintenance is very critical. Components can be more expensive. Newer technologies require technician training. You've got to have training to do this. Fuel rail and lines are made from stainless steel, and a lot of special tools are needed for routine service. Now, this is a three minute video right here. I'll we'll give you a little small visual here. And extremely efficient. These are the main attributes of the all this new is a Ford video. engine from Ford. With only one meter displacement, a new turbocharged Ford Direct Injection engine delivers up to a remarkable 125 horsepower.
strong enough to provide an extraordinary dynamic drive experience. The customer receives the benefit of high performance and the low fuel consumption at the same time thanks to a variety of innovations. The Ford engineers have developed a spec cooling system which enables a much faster heating of the cooling liquid by bypassing the cylinder block in the cold start phase. This leads to less friction in the engine, less fuel consumption and less exhaust emissions when the engine is still cold. The camshaft is operated by a drive belt immersed in oil. The effect again, reduced friction, leading to fuel savings. Variable valve timing optimizes the gas flow through the combustion chamber at all engine speeds, in particular at part load and at full torque. It also enables the so-called scavenging process, whenever the intake as well as the exhaust valves are open at the same time. During this process, the combustion gases are flushed out. In addition, it benefits the turbocharger being stimulated by the airflow. The direct injectors of the second generation direct injection system are located centrally to provide a much cooler and denser fuel-to-air ratio, independent of the piston's geometry. This leads to a more efficient combustion and reduces fuel consumption. The direct injection enables multiple injections per combustion cycle so that the injection can be adapted to the effective requirements. The Ford engineers have designed an all-new exhaust manifold which is now integrated into the cylinder head. This lowers the exhaust temperature and provides an optimum fuel-to-air ratio even at high speeds. In addition, the innovative concept saves money and allows the engine to operate more smoothly. The turbocharger delivers a strong low-end torque. This increases the torque and performance despite the reduced displacement. The small low inertia rotors of the turbine enable high torque with the absolute minimum of delay during quick acceleration processes. The optimized offset crankshaft now produces less friction and also contributes to increasing efficiency. Implemented for the first time, the two-stage variable displacement oil pump ensures that the engine runs at the optimum oil pressure in the entire speed range. This means that the oil pressure is adapted to the individual requirements. Less fuel consumption, less CO2 emissions, but even so, better performance and more fun to drive. The new Ford 1-litre EcoBoost combines forward-looking technologies which are now available today. All right. What'd you learn? What'd you see about that engine? It was unusual. The belt in the oil. The belt went in the oil. What else? Variable valve timing. Variable valve timing is not unusual. You can see that. Variable oil pump. Huh? Variable oil pump. Yeah, variable displacement oil pump. What does that remind you of? Automatic transmission. Variable displacement oil pump. If that thing moves over, the oil pump's got more or less capacity to move the oil. And it's actually matched to the oil demands on that. So I've never seen that on any engine before, or as an oil pump, variable displacement oil pump. But uh, there's some other little blurbs here I got on that. We got a three liter, a three cylinder, one liter engine generating 125 horsepower. Did you see companion cylinders on that? I didn't. I saw them going one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Did you see that? I mean, they were none of, there weren't two coming up and down at the same time on a three-cylinder engine. All right. Variable valve time and intake and exhaust split coolant system, dramatic piston shape changes, camshaft valve belt and oil, increased valve overlap to improve scavenging, reduced turbo lag because of scavenging in GDI, multiple injections, the same firing in vent. This is it. Uh, integrated exhaust manifold with cylinder head, offset crankshaft, two-stage oil pump, gasoline direct injected, obviously. All right, now this is kind of what we're looking at here. This is a really, really, really simple, crappy little drawing that I pulled out of that uh, console and stuff. You basically got a plain old low pressure fuel pump, just like you've always seen before. But when it gets here, that's where it changes. You got a high pressure fuel pump that's feeding that common rail. And then high pressure fuel pump's got a solenoid in it that accelerates so the high pressure of the, can be controlled by the engine controller. It also knows, however, what the low pressure is, and if, if it's got a, I'll say that, if it has a um, module, fuel pump control module, it has to measure the pressure so it'll know how much pressure it's going to put over, and usually about 80 psi, roughly. Uh, and then fuel pump is just like earlier fuel injection systems, doesn't really look any different, nothing new there. All right, the same as port systems, 
Various quick connect fitting made from nylon, plastic, other materials. This is a low pressure system. It's, there's nothing, nothing mysterious about that at all, unless you got a fuel control module. Then you can take a scan tool, look at the fuel control module, compare the, the fuel target to what it actually is, and you can tell what's going on. You can tell how much current is sent into the pump and all that. GDI returnless fuel pressure regulation with pulse width modulation. You know, above your high pressure sensor, incidentally, you got a feedback sensor, this is that feedback I was talking about. Your high pressure sensor is basically giving a return signal so that it'll know what the fuel rail pressure is because it's controlling it in the high pressure pump. Well, most of you got a fuel pump speed module, which is basically going to use, uh, control this, and it's got a low pressure uh, fuel sensor too. You know, you don't hardly ever see that much uh, on, well, on a lot of them, some of them you do. But anyway, you get your, of course, you get your GDI injectors. Now, here's your high pressure side of the system. That's what the pump looks like. That's just, it's bolted in there, but this is what it looks like sitting on these lobes. And it's got this little roller bucket on it that reminds you of the bottom of a roller lifter. And it's driven by two or three or a four lobe camshaft. Uh, the ones that I've seen have mostly been three lobes, but this one here, some of them have got just two eggs on it. And this one here's got four eggs in that one out there. Uh, it can usually held in place with two bolts you don't reuse the bolts. When you pull the bolts out, you put new bolts back in there. I uh, can have a roller follower or a bucket top drive right against the cam load. It's got to be timed when it's solid. Capable of pressure from 500 to 3,000 pounds. And this is a positive displacement pump. What's the difference between a positive displacement pump and one that's not? Is the water pump in a car a positive displacement pump? No. A positive displacement pump is like in your jack out here. When you operate that handle, that oil is going somewhere. It's either going to bypass if the jack's trying to pick up something too heavy or it's going into that piston. But you're not going to have any, any slop getting by there. That's a positive displacement pump. All right. And uh, there will be a pop test on this tomorrow because I'm going to write one and you guys better be able to pass it. Okay, contains an electric pressure regulator solenoid controlled by the PCM. Tomorrow? That's right, that. Well, tomorrow to you is going to be Monday. Okay. All right, contains an internal pressure relief valve. There's a clicking sound that's normal. You're going to hear a clicking sound because of that thing having to bounce and all that. And it'll default to either low or high pressure when the connector is unplugged, depending on the OEM. If you unplug the connector, usually on a Chevrolet, it's going to default to high pressure. If you unplug it on a Ford, it's going to default to low pressure. So what if you took, you know, like on six O's, I got that. Uh, IPR sensor. Yeah. It tells it for hyper or not. It's just a truck now. If you jump the sensor, like the wires, would it say it had high pressure electric crank? If yeah, if that's where the problem somewhere else. But if you disconnect the wires on a on a Ford on on those kind of on those high those with common rail diesels, it goes to the basement. And if you plug it back in, you know, and, and basically on those, as I remember, the ones that I was familiar with only go to like 55 percent tops anyway. Yeah, but these is like, they got two wires on. Uh huh. I yeah. If you jumped it, like. Jumped no, you wouldn't jump it. You got one that's feeding power to it, you'd have to jump the other one to ground. Make it hot? Yeah. No, jump the other one to ground to, to keep the solenoid energized all the time. I don't get this thing to show me what I record. Um, you do it after we're through with class, not do it right now. So you cut all right. the wires on Huh? If you jump those together, you're going to blow a fuse. Or you're going to burn up the engine controller. So if you just jump those together, it's a bad idea. Yeah, it's like a fuel injector. you got power going on one side, the other side you got your control. If you jump them together, you're going to fry the driver. You know, so Basically, you got to understand how that's wired up and how it all works or you're going to be in a pickle. Alright, so, uh, right, so it's got an internal relief valve. This pump has got an internal relief valve. Got a click it sounds because it's all at higher low pressure. Remember that. Uh, so, all right, this is kind of what the pump looks like. Uh, this is a low, this is the camshaft I was holding in my hand when I was up at KC Vision, and this is worn. See the wear on that thing where it's been bouncing that thing? Now, this one here doesn't have the cup on it, but it's just a spring, but that's what that looks like. There's your solenoid, and there's your low pressure coming in, your high pressure coming out. That is not complicated, okay? Now this is kind of what it looks like on the inside. There's your plunger and here's your solenoid and your solenoid basically is it, depending on how it's hooked up, if it'll either default to high pressure or low pressure. And this is actually going out. They don't show you the low pressure coming in. 
Well, when that's bouncing on there, this thing is going to make some high pressure and that's going somewhere. But there is a relief valve in there. And also, as it's pushing that pressure out, you're going to have the, uh, that check ball right there is what's going to keep that high pressure on the fuel rail. And it's supposed to have high pressure on the fuel rail. There are no gauge, there is a low pressure Schrader valve on some of them. But on the, there is no Schrader valve that you can hook or no pressure gauge that you can hook to the high pressure side of that. You absolutely have to depend on the scan tool pit for the high pressure part of that fuel rail. All right. The high pressure fuel lines and rail, there's a good shot of that. They're made from stainless steel for strength and corrosion resistance. Common rail, kind of like a diesel, injectors are attached to the rail with special clips and retainers that you only use one time. And the rail's got a high pressure sensor that's electric on it. All right, no service port for pressure testing because it would be way too dangerous. All right, you can't hardly do that. All right, the line from the high pressure pump often uses a ball top fitting. Most HP lines are one time use. Uh, rails usually bolted in place to the cylinder head like that's not unusual. And rail injectors can be buried under the intake manifold. All right, now this right here, what this injector does is it operates kind of like a diesel. And when you energize it, it basically shortens this stack of piezos so that it can lift that pencil off. It's sort of like a, it's a pop test. You know, you get diesel injectors pop, and basically whenever that high pressure fuel comes in there, it raises that needle off its seat and it sprays out the tip of it down there. And there's a really, you know, close up shot of one particular uh, one of these. They don't all look exactly like that. These rings right here are Teflon. If you ever pull those injectors out of there, you have a special tool to pull them out. And you basically have to replace those Teflon seals, and then there's a tool that you got to use to resize those Teflon seals before you can put the injector back in. So this is not, uh, you know, your father's fuel injection system. Uh, they got these Teflon seals, one time use, and got to be properly sized. And you know, there you go. You port GDI 50 to 70 on your low, uh, high. You know, is 500 to 1900 or 2900. Bolts width and idles one and a half to three and a half, about. You know, this is actually port versus and all that. Now, there are some, you know, lower pressure GDI systems too, but most of them are high, about, you know, point, about 400, uh, you know, microseconds is what you're going to have for pulse width on those. See how, see how much more time there is for that than for this to happen? Injector resistance is 12 to 16 ohms, is a 1 to 3. That's 1 to 3 ohm for speed. The less resistance you got, the more voltage you got, the faster they operate. Uh, 6 volt and 12 volt and only the old port kind and then 50 to 90 volts and then 12 volt. It basically uses 50 volts to pull it off and then it tapers off. Uh, one to three injectors per event. It doesn't just, you know like on your multi-strike, uh, your, uh, like well your MSD ignition and also the, uh, like on that Crown Victoria, the, even that old Escort out there, when it's idling it's popping the coil three times. Well this one here when it's idling it pops the injector three times if it's using a stratified fuel charge. And you've got basically got 13 to 1, 11 to 1, 13 1 on that little chart right there. Don't use noid lights. You can't use a noid light or a 12 volt test light to check the GDI fuel injectors because um, somebody's probably going to come out with one eventually, but there's not one out there right now. All right, so then you've got injector spray design, wall guided swirl combustion chamber side of a cylinder head. That's the, that's the way that one's mounted in there. You notice it's going right into the cylinder, it's not behind the valves like it was before. Spray guided injector on top of cylinder head is basically they'll have one in here where the spark plug is on some of them. Uh, and whenever you've got one that's operating on stratified fuel charge, that little tiny pocket in the piston is the only place where any burning is taking place. And that's usually just when you're in idle. Uh, wall guided tumble combustion piston shape creates a tumbling effect as it moves up. And, you know, there's several different ones. We already talked a little bit about that. That's one of the pistons right there. Many GDI engines got a special shaped piston top to create desired turbulence for concentration of the fuel. Right in that area right there is where the stratified charge is lighting off. If it's, if it's doing stratified means pop, 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 you know. We'll talk about that in a minute. GDI combustion operating modes, homogeneous, homogeneous lean, homogeneous ultra lean, stratified, wide open throttle, and clear flood. Clear flood when you put your foot all the way on the gas and shuts the injectors off and when you're starting it. All right, and uh, there's a little GDI illustration there. And you know, you're basically, that's the one that's coming straight into the middle. Uh, and the spark plug's in a different spot. Uh, definition of homogeneous is a mixture that has uniform composition and properties throughout, like homogeneous milk. Basically, if milk's been homogenized, it's not going to have cream at the top and the other milk at the bottom. All right. 
You can take a teaspoonful of table salt and stir it into a glass of water, makes a homogeneous mix, and all previous carb TBI and port systems used homogeneous mixtures. That's not a new thing, it's an old thing. But stratified charge may be defined as one in which fuel is injected in combustion chamber during the end of the compression stroke and just before the burn-in of the charge. But not all GDI engines use stratified injection. Remember that. Write that down, part of your notes. Used during idle uh, periods of no load, extremely lean mixtures, 40 to 60 to 1. Some European and Asian vehicles use stratified load injection. And this is a problem. This is the problem they've been having with gasoline direct injection, is these pretty deposits on the valve. Now, I will tell you that the ones I was talking about the other day with the olefins in the fuel that we had to clean off the walnut holes and all that, that, they looked real similar to this. But these right here, they got PCV steam that kind of fills up the intake, gathers on these valves and makes a big mess. And this, this is what you're, if you work somewhere where they work on gasoline direct injection engines, you know, you're going to be worrying with this sooner or later. All right. Uh, injector to exhaust inversion, PCV oil, lack of maintenance. Sometimes if people are driving them without looking after them, they, this gets really, really bad. There's your spark plug right there, by the way. And also, the dead gum injectors. The tips of the injectors will get all carboned up so that it's hard to get the injectors out of there. You've got to use those tools to do it. But always depressurize it before service. So how do you depressurize it? You can remove the fuel pump relay and run the engine until it stalls. When I say the fuel pump relay, man, the one that's operating the low-pressure pump, if it's got no low pressure coming in, it'll use up all the high-pressure fuel and no more will replace it. But you better be looking at your scan tool to see what the high-pressure fuel rail pressure is and make doggone sure that it's gone before you ever break that line loose because it may spray on your hand. Just to make sure, what you need to do is Throw a rag all around that fitting down there, put you a wrench on it, and when you break it loose, make sure that if any fuel sprays out, it hits that rag and don't hit you. You got it? Raise your head, Dustin. Yeah, but right. the scale that much pressure. Oh, huh? One, if it's got that much pressure on it, blow a hole in the rag. It might, but a red hole in the rag better than holding your finger, mm -hmm. right? You know, I wouldn't mind it, but, you know, oh, my shop rag is ruined. What are you thinking? <laughs> okay. I mean, I'm going to put the, I ain't going to hold my hand on the rag. I'm going to put the rag down there and just use the wrench to break it loose. You see what I mean? That's after I've already drained all the pressure off the high speed rail. Make doggone sure you protect yourself on that. And it's the same way on them common rail engines you're working on at Matt. You know, you don't want to get surprised by all that high pressure or break it loose while it's running or nothing like that. Those can run up to 23,000 pounds on those Duramax engines. You know? All right, so confirm no high side pressure before the assistant symbol of the system. Use a scan tool to measure the pressure before you pull it apart. So the low pressure system is about the same as poor fuel system. you got filters and stuff like that in there, you know. And I always look for technical service bulletins and that apostrophe shouldn't be there uh, for the service. Uh, the more common high pressure side service procedures, replacing the high pressure pump. That is a common failure because that is, you know what I always said, my rule of thumb is, the part that's working the hardest and is in the most hostile environment is the part that's most likely to fail. And in this particular case it's that. The follower, the bucket, or that rides on top of that load, it's bad to fail. Remove the fuel rail with the injector. It often requires special tools. Replace the injector. It includes the sizing of the Teflon seals. Can't reuse them. Replace the injector. It also requires new retaining clips, O-rings, and all that. When you replace the injector, they'll come with all. You can buy little seal packs and all that kind of thing. Yeah. Replace the, uh, the high-pressure side service procedures. The high-pressure sensor be a simple R&R &R. after you depressurize, you just follow all your procedures, make sure you depressurize because it's in that high pressure fuel, decarbonizing intake manifold and injector cleaning. There's all sorts of stuff BG's coming up with so that you can try to do that, but if it gets bad enough, you just got to pull the intake off and clean it. Uh, remember the HP, the high pressure connecting line from the pump to the rails is a one-time component. You got to replace that whenever you pull it off of there. And if you're looking at scan tool, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. But see, let's say that you got your fuel rail pressure sensor right there. What's 35.86 bar? How much is one bar? And don't say it's $300 if you want to put one in your grand room. You know what I mean? 14 and a half pounds per square inch is a bar. If I multiply 14 and a half PSI times 35.86, I'll see what that fuel pressure is in the high side of that rail fuel pressure sensor, which is your little low pressure sensor, that's just not fuel rail and fuel pressure, that's two different things. 
and then again, you can look at the voltage there and all that. This is just a little bit. Sometimes you can basically have a two-way talk and scan tool, and you can tell things to happen. So you can check and see if you're, you can increase the pressure and see if it can 